Jay Horowitz special edition of Amazing Conversations with my old friend Barry Lyons. Barry, thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. Good seeing you again. Thank you, Jay, for having me. Great to see you and uh, look forward to seeing you uh, at uh, at the uh, number ceremonies yeah. coming up uh, this season. Now, you know, what do you think you and I have in common that people might not know about? One characteristic, you and I are almost the same. We both well, have you, big heads. Yeah, my, big heads. My, my <laughs> nickname growing up was Elephant Head. I remember the guys <laughs> used to call you Melon Head. Am I correct? <laughs> Mallet head, uh, mallet, whatever. There was all kinds of names that. Uh, yeah, I hate Lee, head jokes, Barry. Yeah, Lily Mazzilli started that uh, in spring training uh, one year, and it's kind of stuck. And it, there were various uh, variations of it uh, over the years. Yeah, and, uh, me too, Barry. I'm yeah. a size eight and seven eighths, eight three eighths head. But listen, let me ask you this: eighty six met. What do you think endeared you to Daryl Strawberry and Dwight Gooden as you're invited to post ceremony, number of retirement, uh, Dwight, uh, April 14th, number 16, Daryl, June 1st, number 18. I mean, what do you think you, was in you that you were able to bond with those guys so so good? Well, uh, Dwight and I were in the same draft and. 82, of course, he was a first-round pick, and I was a 15th-round pick. But we met in instructional league that year, and uh, we became close pretty close, pretty much right away. Uh, he's a, a, a genuinely good person with a big heart and a big smile, and uh, uh, we, we got to know each other. I caught him in spring training some, caught him a little bit in that incredible year he had in Lynchburg. Yeah, we were with him a little bit in 83, right? Yeah, yes, three, I did, briefly. Right. And uh, But as far as Darrell's concerned, uh, I saw Darrell play in, in Jackson, Mississippi in 1982 when he was in double A. I'm right. from Mississippi and heard all about uh, the towering home runs he hit into the pine trees beyond the outfield fence. And later on, uh, once I was in the organization, uh, we met and uh, became very close. Uh, they're just really two good guys. And as a team player, I was uh, a backup to Gary Carter most of my career in New York. And I think those guys respected the way I went about my business and, uh, you know, kept my mouth shut and, and did, you know, did what I could do when I was called upon. And uh, so anyway, just uh, a lot of things that brought us together, and uh, they're just two great guys. Well, you told me a story, uh, uh, Barry, a couple of a little while ago that in 2011, uh, at the 25th anniversary of the 86 team, that Daryl really helped turn your life around. Could you explain a little bit? He, he did. Uh, the uh, partying lifestyle that uh, I, you know, certainly – uh, freely and, and chose to participate in over the years in, in baseball. And uh, that lifestyle eventually led to an addiction for me that uh, I battled for many years. But uh, uh, after Hurricane Katrina in 2005, my addiction spiraled out of control. And I really had a... You uh, lost a lot in Hurricane, right? Out of lost, lost quite a bit and, and had uh, depression and, and devastation in my life. And and my addictions really spiraled out of control from that point. But uh, fast forward uh, six years to 2011, uh, we had the 25th anniversary of the Mets 1986 World Series championship. And uh, that weekend, I saw Daryl in a whole different light. Uh, he had been sober for a few years at that point, and uh, he and his wife, Tracy, were uh, we're really beginning uh, what now is an amazing ministry. Uh, but uh, Daryl had a glow about him. He had a peace about him that I hadn't seen in, in you know, many, many years. And and I, I wanted that. And, and we talked a little bit that weekend, and he informed me that uh, he had given his life to Christ and that he had really changed uh, for the better and had been free from alcohol and drugs for a few years at that point, but uh, ultimately about three months later, I finally surrendered and, and uh, I have been 12 plus years now uh, alcohol free and it's been a, a change in my life that uh, Daryl was instrumental in leading me there and then together Daryl and I have been 
you know, uh, working behind the scenes and trying to help others to to uh, free themselves from from the addiction and from that lifestyle. And I just saw something different. I saw a glow around Daryl. I saw a, a peace that you know it's hard to describe but when when someone is that peace someone has that uh, that spiritual connection to the lord uh it, it it's all over their face you know they don't have to say it, it i just saw it and uh, i i sensed that that's something that i wanted and and he encouraged me and shared with me uh you know what changes in his life that he he made and 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 you know, it took a little while longer for me to 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 come to the realization and and to surrender is the way I like to call it. Uh, and uh, like I said, it's been a, a huge blessing for me, and uh, I just am so thankful for Daryl and his and his uh, walk uh, with the Lord and all that he's going to help other people. Why told me too that you were a a, a good counselor for him? Too, what he was going through his problems without being really specific. I mean, how how did you bond with Daryl with that kind of stuff too? Well, we've uh, you know together been praying for for Doc for for several years. I mean, Doc has uh, you know, in my opinion, I don't know all the details, but Doc has had years and of sobriety and has fallen off and sort of been riding that roller coaster over the years. And we've been you know sort of communicating back and forth and and thinking of ways and praying for Dwight that one day he could be totally free of it. And uh, uh, we, we reached out to, to Dwight. I've been with Dwight the last 10 years or so at Mets fantasy camp. And uh, we've talked quite a bit. Uh, we've become really close over the years. We were, you know, the three of us were good friends, certainly from day one, but uh, over the last 10 years, <laughs> our relationship has really bonded and grown in a way that uh it's just a blessing for me to 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 be uh in contact with them on a regular basis to uh to see the good things that they're doing uh Daryl and ministry and Dwight all in the community of New York and New Jersey uh he is such a, a, a both of them are really humble guys that uh, had the with world big hearts and, too with big, big hearts, hearts huge hearts and always have had it and, you know they had great careers you know a lot of people want to talk about the things they didn't do or the things that could have been but both of them had tremendous careers that anyone would give a right arm to have and uh, you know they don't need to be shortchanged and I'm so thankful that uh, Steve and Alex Cohen are recognizing them and and doing this uh and, and placing them in an esteemed position within the Mets organization. They certainly deserve it. Uh, they've earned it. And uh, now, thankfully, they're getting their their due recognition for an amazing careers. And uh, they were the face of the Mets in the 80s. I love Gary Carter and Keith Hernandez. And obviously, they were great players, great leaders. But Daryl Strawberry and Dwight Gooden were what the New York Mets uh, represented to the world and to the country and to baseball and to Major League Baseball. They they were the faces of our team. Hey, Barry, let me touch on your career for a second. You, you come up as a, you know, for a, 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 a 15th round, for 15th round pick. But really from 83 to 86, <laughs> you hit almost 300 every year in the minors. But then... Uh, December of 84, the Mets acquire Gary Carter for five players. I know you and Gary were good friends, but what was your first reaction? You, you were actually the MVP of the South Atlantic League in 84. The, what was your first reaction when you heard about the trade? Yeah, that was the, the Carolina League, actually. Yes, some, Carolina uh, League. some places have it uh, incorrectly, but the Carolina League and – I just come off a, a great season, my really my first full season in the Mets organization. And, uh, you know, it was then I knew I was going to be a big league pl player. I, it was always my dream, but it was a hope and something I aspired to. But, you know, until you get there, you, you don't get there. But I knew and I came in off, coming off a, a great season, uh, that off season, I was just really full of uh, of excitement and hope and 
And I didn't know that I would be in the big leagues in 85. I wasn't necessarily ready right. for that at that point. But I, I knew uh, that one day sooner than later I would be. But uh, I was actually at a friend's house watching Monday Night Football. I was That's <laughs> and, I and all of a sudden on the, on the screen, it flashes up and they start talking. The New York Mets acquired uh, all-star catcher Gary Carter for, I, what, five, six? Five, years. yeah, Hubie Brooks. And, and, you and uh, I was oh. just floored. I didn't know what to say. My friend looked at me and we just kind of looked at each other and it was like, holy yeah. God. Uh, but anyway, it uh, you know, I, I, I pretty much looked at it for, as a positive right off the bat. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Even though Gary, unfortunately for me, was a roadblock in my career, but I, I wouldn't change one thing. I loved being a part of the New York Mets in the 1980s. I loved uh, my teammates. I loved New York City. I loved everything about being a New York Met. Unfortunately, I didn't get to play as much as I would have liked, but I accepted that role and I prepared uh, just like uh, a starting pitcher. I get one one shot a week. Uh, sometimes I, I, I was fortunate to maybe get two uh, starts in some weeks, but uh, I cherished the role. I, I, I did the best I could. Uh, I really bonded with our pitching staff and became really close with all of our pitchers. And, uh, you know, I think all the players, I was the one guy that, you know, pitchers usually hung out with pitchers and position players usually hung out with position players. And there were some cross mingling in there. Uh, we were all close, but uh, I was able to be a part of both groups. And uh, I think that's what uh, endeared uh, my, me to all of my teammates and uh, the role that I played and the way I went about it. Barry, in 86, uh, you get two starts. You could have come up, but is that the year you broke your arm or your elbow? <clears throat> it is. I, I made the team out of spring training. Right. was there for the first month, had a couple of starts, two wins, had an RBI in each game. But, you know, we were off to a great start, and I had jumped from double A to triple A. I mean, from double A to the big league. So I needed some at bats. Uh, they sent me down to to get some at bats and to play at Tidewater in middle of May or latter part of May and uh, called up Ed Hearn. And Ed got several opportunities, more so than I did, and he took advantage of it. He did really well. He played well, hit a couple That's home runs. And... This is August, September, so they it would have been another spot for you, right, man? Yeah, yeah. I, but in August that year, I'd been up. I came up for a few weeks in the middle of the summer when Hojo got hurt, and we carried right. three catchers. Uh, but then when he came back, I went back down in August, uh, I think August uh, 3rd uh, or August 2nd, I suffered a broken right forearm in Pawtucket against the Red Sox, nonetheless, uh, and ended my season. And uh, two days later, Gary busted his thumb, tore ligaments in his thumb, and was out for three weeks or so. Yeah, and I timing really, wasn't great for you, Barry. No, it, it was very disappointing, to say the least. But uh, anyway, it, it is what it is, and it was hard pill to swallow, but uh, life deals you all kinds of things, and uh, I was just glad to be a part of the organization. But eventually you, did, you did get a ring a couple of years later, right? I mean, yes. <clears throat> Nine years later, uh, Randy Myers uh, uh, led the effort to uh, yeah, get well, was a little good. You, he stuck around for a couple of postseason games, right? I mean, we, 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 were you there for the, eight, for the World Series? I forget. Yes. <clears throat> I did come up uh, for the uh, 80 six World Series games, uh, six and seven. I was in New York and with them. I was a, a part of the, the uh, you know, the, the celebration and had a big night the night before. And while I probably could have been in the parade had I showed up, unfortunately, uh, due to the late night, and I went back to my hotel room and I, I didn't wake up. My doc got a lot of publicity for not making the parade. Yeah. Of course, he was looked, upon and expected to be there i could have been there but unfortunately yeah. I, I was in my hotel room asleep when i woke up uh and the parade was on yeah. tv so uh unfortunately i, I missed the parade you. as well so, so how does it feel to be known as the man who ended tom Seaver's pitching <laughs> career let me give the well, fans back with 87 
Tom was attempting to come back with a simulated game in Nor in, in Norfolk, in not Tidewater. Uh, you went six for six against Tom that day. And it is I did. that day. He said, if Barry Lyons goes six for six against me, it's time to call it quits. <laughs> Well, I, I have obviously total and utmost respect for Tom Seaver and the great pitcher he was. But obviously at this point in his career, he wasn't, quote unquote, the Tom Seaver. But uh, uh, we we had a couple of uh, simulated games with him, one in Montreal after he right, pitched right, Tidewater. Right. And Dave Maggot and Tim Tuffle, Bill Allman, who was a reserve infielder, and right, myself were the sort of the, the guinea pigs that had the bat off of him early uh, before BP. And uh, we hit him pretty good up in Montreal. And then four or five days later, back at Shea, uh, I remember rushing in and uh, I was not late, but it was late for me. I wasn't there early and I came in the clubhouse and Uncle Bill, Bill Robinson's like, let's go, let's go. So I got dressed real quick and I, and I just jokingly said to Bill, I said, I, I hate to end this guy's career, but you know he's in trouble today. Lo uh, and behold, I, uh, I I had no clue what what his uh, situation was, what he was thinking. But I hit a couple of line drives first two times up, and then the third time he threw one under my chin, knocked me on my rear. Yeah, that's funny. That's and, Tom. Uh, that was Tom, no. That's and uh, oh, your old buddy Rob Drummerhauser was catching our bullpen yeah. catcher. But the yeah. uh, next pitch, I hit it in the bullpen. I hit a home run off of him. So he, he, he talks that then, was it. By then, I think he kind of knew that uh, it, it wasn't meant to be. And uh, think you know, two days later or whatever, they had the press conference announcing his retirement. Yeah, exactly. And oh, I was a good guy, really good guy. Miss him. Yeah, I, I I hated that uh, you know he wouldn't join us, but uh, obviously. Uh, I had no ill will or no intentions of uh, ending his career, but in some ways, I guess uh, that was the final straw. Now, now what you tell the people what you're doing now? You're doing now. You have to bring pro ball back to your to Biloxi, your hometown. You you're kind of an ambassador. You you were manager for a little bit. Was the Biloxi Shuckers? Biloxi Shuckers. It's a double A franchise, actually, with the. Uh, Milwaukee Brewers. Right. I met uh, David Stearns down here in Biloxi a few years back when he came down to see some of his prospects. Uh, and now, of course, the uh, president right. of operations for the Mets. But uh, uh, it was something that was came to me, uh, a, a vision, a, a hope for me late in my career. And I led the effort and worked for 20 plus years to bring minor league baseball to my hometown and uh i'm fair, forever thankful for that i get double a baseball literally in the neighborhood i grew up in a beautiful ballpark overlooking the gulf of mexico here on the, on the biloxi peninsula it's uh it's a, a little slice of heaven at home and i get to go out and enjoy the home games i don't work for the team right kind of an ambassador kind of role i'm an ambassador i do a little broadcasting i do a lot of interviews for social media and stuff for the team. I, I represent the team in the community and, and speaking engagements and, and, and uh, charity appearances and things of that nature. So I'm involved, but uh, not on the field. I'm uh, more in the community and in the stands. But, but when, you, when you go out speaking, you tell your story you know, yes. the sobriety part of it, or are you, you going to Yes, I've, I've been fortunate to be able to share my testimony uh, many, many times over the years. After COVID, uh, the numbers of opportunity have sort of, you know, taken a downturn, but uh, I still uh, love sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I love sharing and using baseball as a platform, but I have such great memories and, and fondness for, for New York City, for the New York Mets, for the organization and all of my time there. Uh, I, I love sharing it. I'm so excited to be coming back uh, as guests of Daryl and Dwight. Uh, it means the world to me and it means the world to us uh, teammates of Daryl and Dwight that they are finally honored and recognized in such a way. And it's uh 
it's a blessing for them. And I think it's going to be uh, two amazing weekends. And I'm so, so thankful to be a part of them. I get this question a lot, probably. How, tell me how to respond. Do you think that Daryl and Doc's careers, and no, they should have been because they should, they should be in the Hall of Fame. But and I, my response is, what 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 they're doing now is really more important than any Hall of Fame. I yes. mean, do you agree with that? I agree with that one hundred percent, Jay. I, I think that is very very wonderful perspective and viewpoint on, on them. And and I defend them, and I don't have to defend them. They they what they did on the field speaks for itself. They were dynamic superstar players. And they had great careers. Yes, if you want to look at it from a negative angle, you can question some of the things that happened and they, they did and some of the choices they made. But all in all, they, they're they doing great things. They're helping people out uh, all over the country, all over the world. Uh, they're using their, their story to, to help others and, and to to you know, be shining lights in, in what otherwise is a dark world. And uh, Daryl and Dwight both deserve this honor. Uh, they are truly two superstar players, but they are superstar persons. Uh, their hearts are big and always have been. Their uh, their appreciation for for teammates and, and, and people that have helped them along the way is, is awesome. They, they, they're good people. Through and yeah, through. Yeah, being, yeah, you know, like Darrell always says to me, that everybody is meant to be in a Hall of Fame. It can be a Hall of Fame person. After yes. I to do, and Dwight, the same thing, you know. Well, yeah. I'm uh, I'm thrilled to share this and speak with you today, Jay. You're you're a Hall of Famer in, well, in all of our minds, brother. I will look forward to seeing you uh, mid, mid-April before, and be well, and have a safe trip, and and thanks for the time, Barry. Appreciate you. Jay, thank you. I love you, my friend. And, love you too, uh, we'll Barry. see you soon, buddy.